also from Netlify, and she's gonna she's gonna moderate our panel today. So round of applause, please. Hi, I'm Jessica, also work at Netlify with Cassandra. Um, and we have three really great panelists today to talk about, well, the modern web landscape and what came before and what might come next and what they've been doing. Um, and so first we'll call up uh, Matt Vilmans, who you've seen before. Come on up and have a seat. <laughs> yes, we're on. Oh, closer, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, Francis Berryman. We're going to you know, alternate. <laughs> and what's the oh, I don't know if this is on. Oh, it is. I think it was working for you. Is mine working? I'm also mine. <laughs> <laughs> Test. Oh, uh, testing. Okay. Yeah, I think it's working. Okay. I'm working. Okay. Oh. All right. Um, well, now I get to sit too. Uh, thanks for being here. And um, first, we're going to start start out, and each of you just introduce yourselves. So we'll start. I think I already told most of the people here who I am, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't go over that whole story once again. Uh, I'm Matt Billman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Netlify. I don't need your mic. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Frances Berryman. Um, I'm a long-term, long-time front-end developer and designer, but I mostly specialize in working with governments now, and I spend most of my time helping them think about how to reevaluate their technical decisions and build things that have to last for a long time for a lot of people. Um, but I think that we'll talk more about that in a little while. <laughs> I'm Wilson Miner. Um, I'm also a designer and have uh, been brave enough to call myself a web developer at various times <laughs> over the years. Um, but I don't do that as much anymore. Um, uh, I worked on the team that released Django many years ago um, and have done like various things in and out of uh, mostly involving the web ever since. <laughs> so you're saying you want the whole thing? We can. We only have 25 minutes. <laughs> the most understated self-introduction ever. But um, so one of the things that I found that's kind of a commonality with all of you um, and with the Jamstack is the idea of um, breaking things into reusable parts and having systems, design systems or um, systems for development that are made of pieces that you can reuse and um, connect together with instead of having a single purpose kind of a, for example, a monolithic app that has everything all in one place or, you know, um, other systems that are very self-contained and those can be not as long lasting as things that are more modular. Um, and I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about how you came to thinking of some of those things being important and uh, how it has played out in some of the things you've done in the past. Okay. <laughs> you guys look so thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who wants we'll to come back. pop in we'll first? We'll <laughs> yeah. uh, you're welcome to jump in. Um, design systems, that's why I like code, is because code is systematic. It's a good way to reason through design that way. Um, and now it's like that's a very popular way to think about design, I think because a lot of organizations are reaching this sort of scale, scale of product, scale of team, where the um, benefits of working systematically sort of outweigh the what feel like the impediments. Um, and that's been one thing that I've learned in like various cases over the years, is if you're advocating towards a more systematic um, approach and the benefits, it sort of, it only takes off and it only works when it is also the path of least resistance. Um, you see this with framework adoption, you see this with libraries where it's great to say like, this is a better way of working and if we all eat our vegetables and accept this sort of moral duty, um, everything will be better. That doesn't like usually work out. Um, but when it also like happens to be like grease the wheels and like is actually an easier way to work immediately and then you realize the benefits of everybody sort of like converging around these things. That's where I think we've seen these big breakthroughs of 
framework adoption and like everybody sort of con congealing around the same ideas for long enough to actually push the whole like ecosystem forward. Um, but yeah, I think going on that, like um, with the work that I've been doing, I've seen the sort of componentized or pattern library kind of approach really working for um, industries that don't necessarily have as much tech savvy. I think in the Valley where they're used to everyone here kind of knowing the talk and knowing the tech, but then I go into somewhere outside of the Valley and they don't have the expertise. And then when they're handed a set of tools that have already been kind of battle tested, it definitely makes it easier for them to adopt some of the things we'd like them to see. Um, you, you're, I can hear you gasping like you're going to say something. <laughs> um, yeah. No, go on. I, I've, I've actually learned that Matthias has a way of, of when he's saying, mm -hmm, he'll go, and you think that he's actually about to say something. <laughs> but you probably are, so. I can always say something. <laughs> um, no, so I, I, I think one of the things we've seen, that, that I've seen in this journey also from, from one way of building CMSs to another way of building these tools and to how people are starting to build things is, is that path of least resistance changing that, that Wilson Miner talked about, right? That, that some years ago, most front-end developers always just worked by getting some ready-made PhD, uh, PhD, and then like turning it into HTML and CSS and so on, and then handing it over to some back-end implementation team that would take that and try to stuff it into to some kind of, of, of back-end CMS. And, a lot of the time I've been working in this has always been about like how can we sort of try, try to work around that and, and lower that path of resistance so the people doing the initial work can also be the people doing the the, the final work. And, and that's, I think, part of why pattern libraries and all of these things are becoming so, like, are becoming more fashionable now also is also because we've had that sort of more decoupled uh, architecture and because the role of the front ender has sort of changed to where it can really own that pattern library and publish it and and where we're starting to see these tools where you can directly use that pattern library instead of constantly having these handover phases and uh, and implementation phases. Um, so interestingly, those those trends are hitting where systems are kind of a bigger part and that's a big part of what's happening now. Um, what are some things that you miss? What do you miss about the old school days of the web? What's something that you miss from back then? Any volunteers for the first time? I know we chatted about it a bit yesterday and I thought about it really hard. And after our discussion, I think you're right. I really do miss the view source world where you could look at a website and work, worked, you know, really figure out how it works without having to figure out what build steps they took to get there. Um, I'm, I don't, if you've seen glitch.com right now, it's kind of going back to that kind of old school, um, looking at websites, um, being able to see, oh, that's how the CSS does that, that's where the JavaScript comes in, it's really great. And I, it's kind of sad that you can't do that anymore because everything is built and minified. And if I was starting out again today, I'm not sure how I would have picked up, how I would have picked up the same school, skills I have now. Because um, the trial and error I don't know, yeah, it's, it's sort of, I miss that, that's sad that that's gone, I think. I definitely identify with that. I don't know how, I don't know how to tell people like how to learn like web development now, partly because it's, you know, moving so fast, but also like, I can't tell you like, go do what I did. Um, Cause I just like picked apart, you sort of like take apart a watch and like figure out how watches are made. That's sort of how the web like was for a long time. Um, but I think on top of that, another big shift that has happened, you know, in the last it, decade and more so in the last five or six years is we've tipped over this, this edge where web development became software development. Um, and that was not always true. It was always sort of this gray area of like web development. There were a lot of designers who, who like built their own stuff and, um, it was more of a like design implementation thing than it was like software development and the stack was a lot thinner it was just html files on an ftp server like um and like as the the tooling has has evolved and like as the size of teams have have evolved and as the like the task has has evolved it's become like this sort of real kind of 
architecture of software, um, which is great for building big things, but can be a lot harder to like learn incrementally and sort of like move your way in and see like, oh, this giant like React app with all these layers of ab abstraction involved. I have to like, I can't just look at the output and walk back through all those layers of abstraction. I need to know a lot about the assumptions of how you built it and um, and you know you need to publish everything on GitHub for me to like even be able to see it and then I have to like understand all these layers of assumption and abstraction in order to really get to oh these are the choices that they made versus these are the libraries that they deployed and this is the you know the, the stack that they, they chose. What do you miss Matt? Well, I think it's all the same. It's sort of the immediacy and simplicity that 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 we had sort of even before the web, right? When I started out developing on a Commodore 64, and 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 the whole computer was just a blinking cursor saying write something, right? and and it was in some way very, like of course the the flip side of it, it was very limiting, right? Like you you could not build the the tools, the systems, the distribution, anything that that, that we can today, but it was very it was very easily un to understand everything involved, right? Like you could, you would actually look up the manual and see what what, what registers in memory were you touching and so on. And and the start of the web was in the same way. And of course, every every layer has since then added more complexity. La latest the, the HTTP layer that has moved from HTTP one, which was very simple, like you you could really hand write HTTP requests and understand exactly what gets sent back and forth between a browser and a server. And with HTTP2, you have like this multiplexed binary protocol and good good luck understanding that, right? <laughs> and of course, it's more efficient, right? Like, I, I, I mean, all of this is, is for a reason. It's what Wilson is saying. It's becoming real software development in a way. And, and there's a whole architecture in the stack. But I think anyone that was involved before it was that is it's still a little like, oh, where did why, why did it get so complicated? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's kind of interesting too with that, that it also brought software developers who came from like programming and not from the web that are just like, oh, this HTML stuff is weird. I'm just going to hammer it all with a programming language. <laughs> um, some of us coming from the other side of it are like, get off my lawn. <laughs> and. Um, but another thing I wanted to, since you've talked about what you've missed, what do you not miss from developing in the past? What is, is actually better for you now that wasn't, or that you're just glad to not have to see? Like, <laughs> It's starting to be like a panel in the old folks' home. Like, <laughs> I remember. Um, uh, this th we can turn this whole thing into a pitch for Netlify, but one thing that I I took a like not on purpose, but I ended up having sort of like a six or seven year kind of hiatus where I didn't like I didn't push anything like to production for a while. Like my job changed and like more of a designer, more of a manager, and then had a chance to come back and work with a small team and like all right, what have you guys been doing with with the web this whole time? Like surely we've solved all the problems that we were complaining about and it's like, yeah, you don't have to deal with browser bugs anymore. Like that's, that's great. Like I never see IE5 again, like for the rest of my life, that's fine. Um, and then there were a lot of things that just like were the same or, you know, hadn't been solved or we've added, now we have like build tools and we have to deal with that. Um, but one thing that I think has more recently been like considered a solved problem. Um, I hope I never have to deal with uh, SSL cert certificate renewal always comes like in the middle of the night, the site's down, no one knows where the site's down. It's because they're on like these weird three year renewal cycles or something and no one ever remembers or the person who bought it doesn't work here anymore. So um, I think I will have like post-traumatic stress dreams for the rest of my <laughs> life about missing international flights, like taking a final in a class that I realize I've never been to the class for and like realizing that I forgot to renew an SSL certificate, so. <laughs> That's very good, I like that one, yes. Um, I, I, was, I had to th think about this and I think what I don't miss is things like source safe or even worse, having no source control at all. 
Um, I remember like early on doing things like we would have a cup that had JavaScript written on the side of it, and whoever had the cup got to write JavaScript because we didn't have a way to merge files or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, apart from sitting next to someone and literally copying and pasting over the files. I don't, I don't miss those days whatsoever. Um, I really like that Git, Git, SVN, whatever, I don't care what the standard became, but I'm glad there is a standard that everyone seems to have agreed on now and there is a semblance of a standardized workflow around that. Um, I, am, I am glad of my Git overlords. I, I really don't miss PHP. <laughs> I started out first with stuff I built was all based around PHP BB and stuff like that. And uh, and, and I must say, I, I that's one thing I really, really don't miss. <laughs> Those fighting words for some, I think. <laughs> Still, maybe not in this city. <laughs> yes, you can. Still a lot of the web. Um, although, that's changing. <laughs> um, is there anything that, so that now that we're walking away from the old folks' home, things that are happening now or possibly coming into the future that is interesting or exciting or that you would like to see happening with development, a greater focus on X? Let's, we started over there before. So I OK, well, so <laughs> let's take it this time. In the, <laughs> Obviously, right? Like we think that's a very exciting trend, <laughs> but uh, but but of course we're building Netlify because we're seeing some trends we are very excited about, especially about like being able to push a lot of the logic and and a lot of the serving and everything that goes on away from one origin somewhere and out to the edge of the network, um, and that's both in terms of pushing things that used to run on some monolithic server all the way to the browser pushing some things that needed to be generated on the fly on the server somewhere all the way to a content delivery network. And also starting to think about what more can we push in that direction, right? Like what 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 can we do to take specific functionalities and 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 remove them from living in one place and, and being distributed all over the world because it, it, it gives so many inherent benefits. And there's been so much like theory around that and so much work in that space, but it's Again, all about that path of least resistance. Like, how can we make these things actually really easy to work with and find the right set of constraints when you work as a developer to, to say, okay, as long as you stick to these constraints, then all these very interested attributes of being able to distribute things around the world or to the browser or to the client um, becomes becomes possible and, and, and available, right? So that's that's probably the, the thing I'm I'm the most excited about, this shift from 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 having an origin into a system that is, is that that's truly distribu distributed all over. Um, I guess the reason I work on the web is because I care about reach and openness, and that's why I work, have largely worked for public sector organisations or the government. Um, so naturally, I am super excited about the web becoming a first-class citizen on devices again, on our pocket devices. I think the work that Chrome and and Mozilla and everyone are doing with progressive web apps tells me that maybe the days of native apps are fading, and I hope that is true, um, because I have not enjoyed this sort of segmented uh, industry we've been working in. Um, like I say, reach is like my number one interest, so um, I'm, I, fingers crossed that that continues to go well. I feel like it's taking off, and I think if you're not already on the progressive web, progressive web app bandwagon, you probably should look at getting on it. Because um, it's definitely where we are all going to be as web developers in the next five years. Bold words. <laughs> um, I think the trend or like the the movement that I've been like paying attention to or kind of the most interested in seeing where it goes is uh, kind of, I guess, this idea again of convergence. Um, I like spent a lot of time and like did like the most surface area of like web development work and sort of the era of the monolithic fr web framework of like Rails and Django and like that kind of idea where like some probably insane percentage, like now you see like 30% of the internet is on WordPress or something, but it's like that, like 30% of the internet was Ruby on Rails or Django. Um, 
And there's a lot of downsides to that, and we've really, like, the community has really sort of moved away from that or, like, intentionally walked away from that idea of, like, monolithic frameworks for a lot of good reasons. Um, but it does have this net effect of, like, when so much of the community is working around the same, like, basic assumptions, even if those aren't, like, optimal for everyone's case, it enables this sort of innovation on the edges, it enables us, like, we don't have to reinvent the basics because we've all, like, sort of brokered this basic agreement. Um, and I've been interested to see signs of that kind of attitude, like, emerging even in this sort of, like, microservices, microlibrary, like, sort of um, distributed kind of um, environment with things like Netlify or, like, what Zeit has been doing with their their tools and sort of, um, just kind of taking almost these things at the infrastructure layer and making those the sort of shared assumption where you don't have to, like, for every new project, like, reevaluate and rethink, like, how am I going to handle CDN? Like, how am I going to handle deployment? How am I going to do this? You can start with a prototype or a hobby project or something and just spin it up, like, really quickly and really easily and then be set up to go from that, like all the way to like a fully optimized, like production ready, like heavy duty um, project and still sort of just like bake in those kind of basic assumptions and not have to reevaluate at some point, oh shit, like what does my AWS config like need to look like? Like, you know, how do I read up on, you know, like what's the latest on, on um, all these different pieces of it? So it's been interesting to see like ways of accomplishing that kind of like let's all just agree on the same like basic things that none of us want to have to reinvent every time um, so that we can focus on like pushing like innovation at the edges um, which I think is really interesting so now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience Cassandra is in the back so if you have a question that you'd like to ask of our illustrious guest. Testing. Oh. <laughs> microphone oh, is working. working back there. It's working. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. Any question? Oh, it's going to be so quiet. Any question? Any question? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, 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 we got one. I'm brave. So. <laughs> I didn't give you much time to think about that. I really should have yeah. given you more warning. We should have prepared that, everyone. That was my bad. There will be a question segment for the first time and only time today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so my question was uh, around like security with a Jamstack. So, like um, API secrets that you'd normally keep in environment variables. How does that work when you're just serving to the browser, like serving a bundle? This be a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, for so you always need some kind of service that's the that's the source of truth for those. I mean, obviously, you can't expose your secrets to, to, to the client, or they're not very secret anymore. Um, but, but you can have some, like, the, the best way right now, the best answer right now to how to manage that is, is associated with JSON web tokens. And basically with the idea that you can have some service that can issue a, a, a secret that is cryptographically signed and that also contains some more information about the user, the identity of the, the person, the information associated with that secret. And then you can have this secret key that's shared between different microservices. And as long as they know the same secret, you can send these JSON web tokens around and, and, and be sure that each of the services can interpret the same thing and, and are speaking about the same person and so on. So I think right now that's one of the really good answers, like, and it's like a compli complex subject in itself, how that works and what it means to, to do stateless authentication and things like that. But, but everything we've done around that, for example, for the smashing projects or for many of the other projects we work with is, is typically based around this, this idea of, of using JSON web tokens um, to, so, so you have effectively have one service that can sign those and send them out and then other services that, that just needs to look at them and say, okay, this, this, this is the right thing. Um, so that's, that's, that's a short form of the answer. <laughs> if, if that's of interest to you, then I believe, slash I know, I hope, I hope I'm not lying. That on jamstack.org under videos um, re resources section, there's a talk on uh, JWT web tokens. 
And Are you going to say that? <laughs> no, no. Actually, I, I thought you were going to say this, which is that on May 12th at SFHTML5, um, Matt's going to be speaking on that very topic. And um, also one of the other speakers today, Brian Douglas, is going to be speaking, and so am I. We encourage you to come, but you can learn more about just what you asked about <laughs> in two and a half weeks. <laughs> <laughs> any any, uh, any other questions? Oh, we got one up here. Way up. Oh yeah, let's go with this one. Here, I'll go around. It's easier for oh. me. I, I didn't oh, but, see. You. But you're gonna have to go Sorry. up to them. Oh. oh, I get to go to the front now. Um, oh, my question is revolves around um, adoption in um, both like enterprise as well as uh, the public domains. Um, it sounds like a lot of uh, government agencies are just catching on to containerization, um, let alone like serverless now, and then let alone like the Jamstack. So, um, what is like the current rate of adoption, or just kind of like the the current sentiment that you've seen, maybe like public sector as well as um, enterprise? Um, yeah, public sector is slower, but for good reason. I mean, they have to select software or practices that seem robust, and I don't generally recommend them to jump on the newest bandwagons because there isn't necessarily a community there already to help support them into that transition. Um, for example, a lot of people ask me why don't governments use more of our free open source software, right? Which is a classic one. It's like, well, A, it's free, which means that they can't buy support, right? They, they, it, it's actually better for them often to be able to buy something because it will come with an SLA um, and that kind of goes for the things like these like well, who are they going to hire to come and Im implement their microservice blah 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 right that they can afford and that want to work at government level so it they will always be behind in a way but that's not necessarily a bad thing because if we know what we're like as an industry we tend to be a bit flighty <laughs> right and then if we tell everyone to go and adopt this new brand new thing in the government and then five years later and there's no one left to support it, um, we're going to be really mad at them. And that won't be fair. So do I think you have like a follow-up question? Of course. Um, what, what would you see as mainly like some of the, like, um, I guess like a critical path to be public sector ready? Uh, that's a fair question. Like, um, do you foresee the Jamstack ever yeah. being like public yeah. sector ready? Yeah, so he was just asking, um, I got it, I got it. He was just asking what would be a critical path for something like the Jamstack or, an, or maybe an open source software project to make it into a public domain project or a, a, a large public project. I think, and I'm sure Wilson will have opinions about this too, I think um, having a good community around it is really important because that's how you hire people to come and work with those technologies at a reasonable rate. Um, I think you should be very open about who owns all those aspects of that that stack, say, say it's a stack, like who owns all those pieces of software? How do they know that they can use them freely? How do they know when they can use them, where they can use them across borders, for example, right? Because governments have to do things around the world. Um, i trying to think of other good reasons. Um, I, I've seen success with um, open source organizations that have foundations so that they have a more sort of charitable wing or a sort of organization that helps them stay on, 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 on target, on, on their goals. Um, I'm not quite sure of the phrase that. I'm sure you have probably experienced foundations in open source software yourself. No? No. No. Okay. Never mind. But that's how, uh, you know, uh, um, I've forgotten the, what else you asked me. Would the Jamstack ever make it? Yeah, probably, because it is a service that you can probably offer with a service level agreement. They could probably buy a service from you, which is to, you know, have a license, have, a, have an agreed number of support and hours, that is a completely legitimate way that a government can work with something like, like the Jamstack, and that's completely feasible, I think. That's how Slack and everything's getting in there, right? They provide a more structured support group for those public service organizations. Yeah, just one um, aspect of that that's, that's relevant to like, this idea of, like one of the advantages of monolithic like, frameworks is that even though Django was open source, it was um, complete enough, like it solved a whole problem, or it was it represented a whole stack for for the most part. Um, and Rails the same way, such that like organizations over time like could adopt it and like see what the like backwards compatibility policy of this one framework is, and they can like put their trust in one place. Um, obviously, there are advantages to 
like moving away from that model, but like we're starting to see if you think like I might look at something like React and say like I understand what Facebook is saying and like what they're promising in terms of backwards compatibility and API changes. I believe that this will exist in five years um, and there will be a community uh, like built up around it. But everything else that I need to do like for each piece of that, I don't. I start start to erode that trust. I do I like. Do I know like that all, all the choices that I'm going to make like about this implementation, even as a developer, like working on a contract, can I assure this organization like that like if I'm not available or somebody else is available that they will be able to support this? And that can be really tricky with all these different pieces and parts. So we're starting to see organizations sort of build, you know, like entities around sort of corralling these things um, and I think that's going to be like meaningful over time it's like because almost like we've validated like these pieces of the stack and we're going to stick with them and like we have this sort of durability that that's like reassuring to the like broader ecosystem but yeah it's a lot slower Yeah, I mean, it resonates so much with, with what we're doing at Netlify, right, which, which is also so much about being able to, to take, like, this whole idea of this, uh, of this Jamstack approach with uh, microservices and frameworks and so on is, is, is decoupling and it gives you a lot of freedom and you can take all these pieces and you can put them together in different ways and so on. And on the other like on the other hand, of course, what can be a barrier is that you have to, right? Like that you have to pick the different pieces and put them together. And if you have to do that every time, that that be, that that's not viable, right? So a lot of what we are working on is creating that viable workflow around it and that convergence where you can where you can have systems that 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 solve the whole problem and that have a batteries included package that where you can swap out the batteries if you want some other ones right but where but where you have a fairly solid a, a completely solid path to something that you can actually use in a big enterprise or with your business client or anywhere like that it just made me realize that's exactly why jamstack will end up working in an environment like that because the contracts that i now encourage governments to write are ones to ask for small pieces of software not the monoliths anymore. Yeah. So if they can then essentially be buying platforms that provide those small platforms, uh, small components, then it's kind of like half the work done for them because they spend so much money just on integration, yeah. like an insane amount. Yeah. yeah. All right, and that is time for us. So if you could join me in thanking our panelists. Mm -hmm. <laughs>